This is a good news story. Immune checkpoint inhibition and immunotherapy itself is a good news story. Immunotherapy has absolutely transformed the prognosis for many people with many different kinds of cancer. When they told me cancer, I thought, that's it. I'm gone. This is the end of my life. And uh, it wasn't. We saved the life of so many stage four cancer patients with these drugs. I had no other solutions. Now there are indications for checkpoint inhibitors in over 15 different types of cancer. And it's really incredible because even if you look here in Mass General in 2011, we treated like 20 patients or so. Then we treated 50, then 100, then 200. Now we're up over 1,000 patients a year and that's just here alone. But the reality is this is very unnatural to take something that's evolutionary, a tightly controlled mechanism, and somewhat unleash it. And it was pretty clear in 2016 that we were starting to see patients that were admitted with toxicity related to some of these novel therapies. That really stunned me and kind of changed, I think, my whole career trajectory because it made me take a step back and all of a sudden we had all these questions. So from that point forward, um, we actually have created a new service to really think about this type of patient population. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? So obviously kind of, you know the whole team, but Victoria is your nurse today. And Helen from the research team is here. I know you met I her know. Yep. earlier. She took all my samples. I know she did. <laughs> and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about kind of how did that go yesterday when you went down for that heart biopsy? You okay in terms of all the testing? I'm, I'm fine. You guys, are, you guys are trying to figure out what's wrong with me. I mean, I came, I came here in despair. I didn't... I've been fighting this battle for six years, and I've never felt the way I felt. But that was dying. Yeah. This is so humbling. We still don't have the right answers. You know, how do we prepare the people in the hospital to take care of these patients? How do we make sure when people come to the bedside that they've seen this before? And the underlying one of what are we treating? The hardest thing about caring for these patients is that they come to us, they're so excited about how things are going with their cancer therapy, and then they develop the toxicity. And the key is keeping them on track and getting them better so that they can go back to their anti-cancer therapy. Right, so. yeah, and I need all the beauty sleep I can get. I know, I know, yeah, we all do. It's oncologists like myself that treat cancer patients predominantly, but we also have specialists that are seeing our cancer patients. So specialists in every specialty that we might need to call on at any minute. I'm not sure anywhere else has um, a team like this. We have a SWAT team here at Mass General to care for these patients. We are all on joint emails or it's a text message and a quick phone call that says, we need you to come in and see this person. So I had a patient come in and I was worried about three different possible toxicities in the patient. That was 8.30 on a Sunday night and I messaged our team, right? But by nine o'clock we had cardiac recs who were also concerned. We had renal recs that said, I'll see them in the morning. And we had the other pieces of the puzzle that we needed to. And we were all actually at the same conference on seven o'clock that next morning. It happened to be a Monday morning. Thank you so much for coming to the Severe Immunotherapy Complications Case Conference. Um, we're gonna talk about those drugs that that we use in the second line setting or when steroids are not working. And so every other week before work, 7 a.m. on a Monday, we join forces to really talk about actual patient cases. How are we gonna move the field forward and what are really next steps? We really tried to start this as something different so that we can all study together, learn together, see the same patients together, and also link to the same basic science lab, right? So having Chloe Villani and having that lab there for those people to dock into from all across the hospital is really quite unique. My name is Alexandra Chloe Villani. I go by Chloe. Um, I'm many things, but essentially at heart, I'm a scientist, I'm an immunologist, I'm a genomicist. I don't like to be put in a box. I'm someone who um, enjoys solving puzzles, right? I'm trying to solve the puzzle using big data. In this case, the puzzles are trying to understand what are the guilty cells that drive different type of disease. And very often I'm presented with 100,000 pieces 
where the puzzle should only be a thousand piece. And it's not in 2D, it's more than three dimensions. And so here we are using big data approach to try to figure out what are the pieces of the puzzle and how do they fit together. And we actually have the technologies here to do that, which is amazing, called single cell genomics, right? This is what I do here. We have these technologies to try to figure out are there particular cells, we call them the guilty cells, that are enriched for all of these defective pathways? And if so, it doesn't matter which defective pathways are involved. It matters that it all affects the same cell. So the way we've been analyzing the composition of a tissue is analogous to analyzing the content of a beautiful fruit salad. The way we've been doing it for over a decade is taking a beautiful fruit salad making a fruit smoothie, and, and then trying to figure out what's in the fruit smoothie. So now, for example, let's say you had three blueberries in your fruit salad. One of them was rotten, okay? So this would be the equivalent of saying like you had one pathogenic cells driving the disease. Can you taste blueberries? Are they from Maine? Are they rotten? How many are there? Could you tell me? You couldn't tell which one actually really matters. Now, with the single cell technologies, I can analyze every cell that makes up your tissues and identify which cells are promoting health, which cells are likely to promote disease. And that's part of the power of single cell genomics. Carrie is an amazing partner in crime. Like, I was missing a good clinical partners and she was missing a good translational partners. And together we strategized about all the key players we should bring together and what needed to be built in the clinic, what needed to be built in the lab. And it's so humbling to see everybody you reach out to to be part of the team saying, yes, we believe in it, let's do it. This was all done the first year without any financial support. Like, it was me alone with my pipettes. <laughs> so I had to convince people to join the mission and the vision and, and telling them that you will learn precision medicine, right? You will get to see these patients, try to find better solutions from them using big data approach. You know, join the effort. And it kind of makes hard work really fun because it is crazy hours. This is not a nine to five job. But if you love what you do, then not a single day ends up being a day of work. Changing the world through science is a privilege, and I get to do it with Carrie. So 224 patients are both collected. That's a milestone. So we should decide when we celebrate. Maybe 250? Yeah, yeah. 250 patients. So 250. At the end of the day, the reason we can do it, it's because of the generosity of patients and their family that are willing to entrust us and share with us some of their tissue samples to enable this investigation. And that's incredibly humbling. It's one of the reasons I came to MGH. You can actually, you can actually put a face right, on who you work for. I'm pretty confident with the team that you all put together. Yeah. This team is uh, pretty caring. And each, each team for each specific organ, you know, was focused on what they needed to do. And that was very, very reassuring. Yeah. And it's complicated, right? Because even this case, we didn't have a lot of diagnostics to really figure this out. But. Think about this. If you, if you hadn't done what you did, you know, what was the course for me? Yeah. You know, what was going to happen to me? Yeah. You know? You know, for all of us, this is somewhat exciting to be able to think about these questions. But what really matters most is that on a daily basis, when I round, I see these patients. They're in the bed. They're extremely vulnerable. They need you to answer these questions. They need you to figure this out.